Welcome back. The title of this mini lecture is The Seven Years' War, part two. And we're going to talk about five terms that, as you read more about this conflict, use these as a guide to start to understand the complexities of it. All right, let's get into it. The first term for us is William Pitt. So William Pitt was the prime minister, kind of leader of the parliament, basically from about 1757 to about 1761. Now, he had a number of names, William Pitt the Elder, because his son, William Pitt the Younger, is a really important prime minister later, uh, the great commoner, right, this kind of thing. But the big deal with Pitt is that he comes into power in 1757, firmly convinced that the Seven Years War, this conflict, the British need to devote as many resources as they can to winning it, and in particular, they need to be able to win in the Americas. Uh, and so he's going to have a number of strategies in order to try to be able to do this. And the British Army and the Navy are going to try to put those into effect, right? So the idea of holding down troops in Germany, using the British Navy to conduct raids off the French coast, right? And there's a number of others. You know, the use of the Navy is a big deal with that. All right, that brings us to our second term, Montcalm, or Louis-Joseph Montcalm. Now, the Marquis de Montcalm was an important figure for our purposes here. So he's going to be the general-in-chief of the French forces in New France when he arrives, 1757, 1758, uh, against the British. And Montcalm does his best. So by 1757, 1758, British resources are rising. The French are cutting off the resource commitment that they're making to their colony, which is going to make it really difficult for Montcalm. And he's carrying out a series of fortress attacks, some of which are successful, some of which he doesn't carry through. And so some of his generalship is a bit questioned, particularly by some uh, French-Canadian officers and that kind of thing. But Montcalm is a significant figure for understanding the tenor of French military responses between 1758 and 1759, especially because uh, Montcalm also dies in 1759, which actually brings us to our third point, Quebec or Quebec City. So by the time you get to early 1759, the British are focused on a Canada strategy that involves an expedition there with a sizable contingent of troops, as well as a sizable contingent of the British Navy. So they're going to go up to St. Lawrence and they're going to make their way down. Now, Quebec is, you know, it's at the point, it's this big walled city, you know, North America, very important sort of city sitting here. And what will happen is the British are going to sit there and they're going to lay siege to it for a couple of months. Uh, and eventually, so the city has this lower city part. It's got this upper walled city area. What happens is the British find a way to land forces behind it and then to kind of force the French into military action. This becomes known as the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. Now, Montcalm has been questioned for basically agreeing to come out of the garrison and fight. But Montcalm basically argued at the time that he had really sort of no other choice. Uh, Eventually, the French forces are going to lose. They're going to get defeated here. Uh, the expedition and conflict in Canada will continue until about 1761, after the capture of Montreal, a number of other territories here. But the battle at Quebec is usually seen as kind of this very big, very symbolic act, partly because right the war itself was very unifying for Canada. The war is very unifying um, as well for the British. And both of these leaders, right, so the French leader here, Montcalm, uh, dies as a result of his wounds in battle, uh, as does the British leader, a commander by the name of Wolfe. Uh, they both, uh, you know, die after the battle. You, you'll have a number of paintings and, and, and portraitures and things that are done of this that uh, get printed and sent all over the world. You know, you know it's, a, it's a very famous battle because of that. All right, this brings us to our fourth point, Havana. So... I don't know about anyone who would be watching this, but when I was a kid growing up, when we mentioned the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, the assumption was that it only happened in the Americas, right? It particularly only happened in America, in the U.S., right? Or maybe in Canada. That's it. It didn't happen south in any way, shape, or form. It didn't necessarily happen around the world. We didn't really 
talk about it that way or think about it that way. Uh, you know, that was not how it was conveyed to me uh, as a younger person. In reality, of course, the Seven Years' War is in many ways the first global war that exists in the world. Uh, the war is fought all over uh, in India and elsewhere. Uh, and an example of that would be the fact that the British are going to carry out military action against Spanish forces in Cuba, uh, laying siege to the city of Havana and capturing it in 1762, on August of 1762. Now, interestingly enough, uh, although there is a bit of prize and reward there for some of the British officers involved, the peace of Paris, which happens the next year, <laughs> the British are going to have to turn around. They're going to give it all. Give, give the city back. All right, that brings us to our fifth point, uh, which is the Peace of Paris, or the Treaty of Paris. Uh, now, this is articulated in 1763. This brings an end to the conflict. The British have won the war, uh, and they're going to make serious territorial gains and acquisitions across the Americas in the construction of this fairly substantive empire. Now, this would give the British access uh, up through the Mississippi River, but they're also going to have a fairly significant swath of land where the idea is that the British are going to want to restrict access to this, and they're going to create this series of garrison lines uh, for this, uh, which those garrisons are now going to cost money, and they're going to start to expect that the American colonists uh, are going to pay uh, to kind of offset the cost of that, which, of course, that's going to result in taxes, uh, which is going to lead the American colonists to get a little bit set. Uh, so the Peace of Paris is very significant, not only for bringing this global conflict to a close, but also for beginning to set up some of the political preconditions that are going to contribute eventually to the American Revolutionary War. Thanks very much.